I described, where we go after these other countries. So, Chaffetz, you were shaking your head when Mr. Bremer was offering that. I, I, I'm assuming that you don't agree with that assessment. No, I don't agree. I think that going into a, a, Afghanistan is exactly the wrong thing to do. Afghanistan is a, is a sideshow. It's a remarkably difficult country to accomplish anything in. And it's a country which doesn't, uh, aside from providing a safe haven for the Taliban, for, the, uh, for bin Laden, doesn't really pose a, a major threat in itself. The real threats, America needs to go after the real threats. It can't pretend, I mean, it's been convenient up until now to play all sorts of games about what's dangerous and what isn't. The World Trade Center ought to tell everybody that it is too dangerous to allow rogue nations, whether it's Iran or Iraq or Syria or perhaps Libya or others, to have weapons of mass destruction because they will be used not just by terrorists whom they harbor, but by them, but by the governments themselves. And j just to pursue this, because we're down to the last couple of minutes, if we go to war with Iran, Iraq, Syria, maybe Libya, what is to prevent? It seems to me if there's one thing that will guarantee a terrorist with the capability to unleash germ warfare to do it, it's that. The, so do we win under those circumstances? The, the beginning of wisdom in this in this conflict is to put aside past uh, conceptions and to understand that there's no need to be so pessimistic. If America could, could defeat Germany and Japan, it can defeat Syria and Iran. And if the Iranians and the Syrians or the Iraqis have weapons, better that, they, that, that whatever happens happens now and not three years from now. Judith Miller, I want to give you the last word because you were shaking your head when, when Zev was, at least we didn't book a panel where everyone was agreeing. So let me, I'm going to ask you to, to, to cap sure. this by answering the question that I asked uh, Mr. Bremer. How will we know when we've won? What does it mean to win? I think I have to agree with Jerry Bremer that it's, uh, Paul, though, uh, we'll never be able to just declare victory, but I think you will see that there will be no more attacks like the attacks we've seen. And you know, nobody's a, a soothsayer. We cannot uh, determine how this long struggle will come out. But I do know that it's going to be, a, I think, it's going to be a very long struggle indeed. Tough conversation for a Friday night, but this has not been the usual week we have been used to. Thanks very much to uh, my guest, Judith Miller of the New York Times, uh, Zev Chaffetz of the New York Daily News, and then Washington L. Paul Bremer, former ambassador at large for counterterrorism in the Reagan administration, and Mr. Bremer. Uh, we hope that uh, the miracle can happen with your colleagues. Thank you for all for joining us. Aaron Brown, back to you. Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, it's at the bottom of the hour now, let's take a look quickly at some of the latest developments for those of you who may just be joining us. Some things have changed along the way as well. Searchers have found the cockpit voice recorder from the hijacked plane that crashed in Pennsylvania on Tuesday. Much information is possible there. Rescuers trying to reach the World Trade Center through a train tunnel that goes uh, under the uh, Hudson River from New Jersey were thwarted tonight when they found that the last 500 feet was flooded to the ceiling. They were hoping that there might be uh, some survivors in the train or in the tunnels on those uh, lower levels, but that is not to be. Two men said to have detailed knowledge of the terrorist network are taken to New York from Texas tonight. They were taken from an Amtrak train. They were armed with box cutters and without legal ID. And late tonight, the House of Representatives followed the Senate in passing a use of force resolution. It is a resolution that gives the president a green light to use military force to go after the terrorists, the masterminds, and those countries the president believes harbors them. One dissenting vote there. And observances of a National Day of Prayer and Remembrance continue tonight. Earlier, Many of the giant marquees along the Las Vegas Strip went dark in tribute to the victims of Tuesday's attack. We, um, I want to show you a couple things here. I'm sorry, they're just getting organized a bit. These are pictures we just got of the, <coughs> excuse me, Ground Zero area. This was shot by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, today. And you see the rescue workers moving in. I think as we, we get a little, there we go, we get a much better sense of uh, two things, it seems to me, the extent of the damage and the broadness of the damage as well. And you also get a sense of the people who are working there, uh, the fatigue on their faces and the rest. These are pictures that were shot, as we say, by FEMA 
as FEMA officials toured uh, the area today. The, they came in around the time the president came in. Now a series of still pictures. This is in the moments after the first plane hit the first tower on Tuesday. These were taken in tower number one. As you see people coming down the stairwell trying to get out. Look at the on the right side, the, uh, the woman's face, if you can see it. I think there's, is there one more in this sequence, David? Okay, let's take a look. Again, these were shot shortly uh, after the plane hit on Tuesday in the first of the towers at the World Trade Center. We have, uh, I think, three or four more of those pictures at our website. You can go to our website at CNN.com. Try and uh, help make people through this time of grief. As you know, Americans today all over the country really came together, big cities, small cities, for a National Day of Prayer and Remembrance. National Correspondent Bruce Morton takes a look at all that was said and heard there. Church services everywhere. America's leadership was at Washington's National Cathedral, but services everywhere. Cleveland, Ohio. We mourn for the many lives lost in a tragedy that remains etched in our minds forever. Boston, Massachusetts. Look with compassion on the whole human family, and especially on those who lost their lives this week. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. At the Pentagon, where many lost fellow workers and friends. May God comfort all of you that are in loss today. And may we wait on him and renew our strength. Manchester, New Hampshire. An Islamic service in Sterling, Virginia, near Dulles Airport. When people yeah, they accuse you of being terrorist, this is because this is what, this is what they were told. Austin, Texas. Manage the violence that has been in our midst and the evil that exists around us. Back at Washington's National Cathedral, the Commander-in-Chief. This conflict was begun on the timing and terms of others. It will end in a way and at an hour of our choosing. That service ended with a hymn, a battle hymn. <laughs> Bruce Morton, CNN, Washington. This tragedy has been, we suspect, especially difficult for the many millions of Arab Americans in the country. Uh, there has been a considerable amount of harassment of them. This is a very difficult time. They, too, in many places in the country, gathered to pray in this national day of mourning and remembrance. CNN's Richard Blystone uh, on the New York Muslim community now. A community rich in immigrants, sharing the time-honored aim of making it in America. Still on good terms with their old cultures. Still strong in their faith, Islam. Atlantic Avenue, they proudly say, is the oldest Arab community in New York. And as stunned as anyone by Tuesday's carnage. It's shocking, it's uh, horrible, um, uh, you feel very bad, you know. What's different here is fear of taking the blame. All Arab American and Muslims in this country that reside and live and make their living in this country are as good as American as anyone else that came from all over the world and they love the American flag just like any pla anyone else and they have nothing to do against this country and this is one of the reasons we are living in this country. Nonetheless, Atlantic Avenue today is keeping a low profile, lest the rash of slurs and slights and insults get more serious. Ahmed Morsi is passing out a letter in Arabic from the New York District Attorney, 
telling Arabs and Muslims where to call if harassed or attacked, like his own mother on Tuesday. She was spit at, um, go back to your country, die, this and all these different slurs um, and different, um, you, know, and, you know, my mother. Islam is a religion of tolerance, says the Imam Abdul Rahman Tafa, a religion that forbids ignorant wars between nations. Muslims from 22 nations come to pray here. We all feel the pain of what happens, says the Imam. And he asks, please give blood, money, whatever you can to help victims of the disaster. But if the attackers were Muslims pursuing what they saw as a holy war, did Islam attack America? Jihad is for defense and defense only, he says. And anyone who preaches otherwise doesn't know Islam. The Quran says if a man murders another human being, it is as though he killed all humanity. This Friday service ends with special prayers for all those who were killed, including at least 50 Muslims. Richard Blystone, CNN, Brooklyn, New York. One of the things that seems to be binding all Americans these days, no matter their backgrounds, in the aftermath of this tragedy is a renewed sense of patriotism. We came across a statistic today that uh, just since Tuesday, Kmart and Walmart, the two giant retailers, have sold about a half a million American flags. Obviously, many other flags have been uh, sold as well. It would seem that many people feel that there is no other place to turn, that the flag is the one thing that connects them all and makes them feel a little bit better in a very difficult time. Here's CNN's Ann McDermott. You might take this guy for a loony in better days, but these are days of rage. Our people, this is our people. This is our land. This is our way of life. And the people below are with him. And in a way, so is Arthur Jagel, who heard and saw things this week he could not take in. They were unbelievable. I thought that it was just a dream but it wasn't. He is glad to know, though, that others are doing what he's doing this day, flying their flags. When they can find them, this man wanted a big one. Well, unfortunately, it's all they have left. But Rose Tibbs didn't care what kind of flag she got, too sad to care. You know, it just, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart to think that people have so much anger and hate in their hearts that they could do something like this. She took her flags back to work, handed them out to her office mates, and then they watched TV. A prayer service was on. People seem to want prayer these days, hoping perhaps that God will shed his grace on them. But America, meanwhile, is opening up its heart and wallet. These radio stations collected more than $100,000 for victim relief in just a couple of hours. And here, too, they show the colors, something that perhaps seems trivial against a backdrop of so much suffering, but for Michael Moranga, it says what he feels. We're here and we're not going away. Ann McDermott, CNN, Los Angeles. This week that has been like no other is going to lead to a weekend that is going to be anything but usual as well. There are going to be no Major League Baseball games. All Major League Baseball games have been uh, canceled through the weekend. The National Football League has canceled its uh, games as well, so no games, no football on Sunday. And there will be only a few college games as well. The Emmy Awards uh, were scheduled for Sunday. They've been moved to next month. And the release of a number of movies has also been postponed for the weekend because they're pretty violent and that seemed pretty inappropriate given all the violence that we've seen. CNN's Beth Nissen now on what New Yorkers are doing to try and escape, to try and escape this tragedy. For most New Yorkers, it doesn't seem much like the start of a weekend. Still, in a week when so many people who went to work on Tuesday never came home, it was good to see the work week end. Many headed out of town for hastily arranged family gatherings. Jason Spiewak was taking Amtrak to his parents' home in Pennsylvania. I've just been stirred up all week by the, you know, the goings-on. I just want to be close to family and friends. 
Bree McCallop was going home to Florida. I live by myself and I, I really just don't want to be here right now. I just don't feel comfortable being here. I don't feel safe. Almost everyone understood the desire to get away from the unrelenting anguish and distress and fear to read about and think about something else, anything else. You'd almost want the new fall season on TV because, you know, it's, it's an escape. Everywhere you look is just inundated with the pictures that you've seen over and over and over, and it's 24-7. And you have to switch to something like Cartoon Network just to escape from it. In Times Square, hundreds of people lined up in the rain to buy half-price tickets to Broadway shows. Patricia McClellan was trying to get tickets to Beauty and the Beast for her two school-aged children. Trying to pick up their spirits and get them together and get them away from viewing everything that they've been looking at for the last week. After four days of almost unbearable real-life drama, many wanted to see a stage story with a clear resolution, a happy ending. Uh, the theater provides for us a little bit of release, a little bit of relief from what's going on. Um, we can't ever forget what's gone on here in New York, it's a great tragedy, but it gives us a little bit of a mental vacation. Those who went to New York City movie theaters seemed in search of the same thing. It's quite ironic that I'm choosing to go to the movies for two hours, considering this is like being in a movie, it's surreal. It's like a, a Hollywood horror film, and yet I'm looking for a film to kind of just take my mind away from it, you know. Legions of others just wanted to stay home. Some rented half a dozen videos. I've never rented a movie before. I just got a membership today because I plan on staying in the house all weekend. I'm not going to do anything because of the incident. Because of that horrible incident, NFL and college football games, a usual weekend release for thousands of sports-mad New Yorkers, were canceled. I wish I had the distraction to the release of the football season, but I understand as uh, playing football uh, myself, um, the tension of what happened at the World Trade Center, I wouldn't want to play if I was a player. Not everyone wanted distraction. Some wanted a few hours of quiet to try to cope with the stun and the sorrow. A lot of people died and it, made, it broke my heart. It literally broke my heart. And I feel like crying right now. Millions of New Yorkers still need comforting. Many said they plan to attend religious services this weekend, go to temple tonight, mass tomorrow, or church on Sunday. The Marble Collegiate Church on Fifth Avenue has added a second service Sunday to accommodate what senior minister Arthur Caliandro expects will be standing room crowds. I think what people are looking for is sanctuary, a place to be where they're, they're safe emotionally and physically, but also that we're spiritually. But feeling safe again seems such a long way off for most New Yorkers. So much loss still uncounted. And for most people, nothing they can do except try their best to make it through tomorrow and the next day and a long succession of days after. Beth Nissen, CNN, New York. We want to button up a little bit of business that uh, we've been telling you about, that the House of Representatives just a short time ago passed the use of force resolution. The Senate had passed it unanimously earlier in the day. The House working late into this uh, Friday evening has now done the same, but not quite unanimously. Jonathan Carl, who covers uh, the Congress for us, joins us now and can give us uh, some of what happened in the House chambers. Jonathan, good evening. Well, Aaron, the House vote, which took place just a short while ago, was 420 to 1. The only dissenting voice was uh, Democrat Barbara Lee of California voting no, all other members of the House of Representatives voting yes, authorizing the President to use all necessary and appropriate force against those responsible for these attacks. With virtually no dissent, Congress authorized the President to use all necessary and appropriate force against all those tied to the attacks for constitutional purposes, it's the same as a declaration of war. There is no constitutional difference between authorizing the president to use this kind of force and saying we declare war. The hurried vote united conservatives and liberals who usually disagree about military intervention. Paul Wellstone, whose first significant vote as a senator a decade ago was against the use of force against Iraq in the Persian Gulf War, was one of the few to speak before the vote. It's going to be a long, difficult struggle, but I believe people in our country and people in Minnesota are united in this. But we need to do this the smart way. Despite the lack of debate, members of both parties had privately objected to a White House request for a more open-ended authorization of force against terrorists. 
As a result, the resolution passed authorizes the president to use military action specifically, quote, against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons. It relates to the incident, and there's broad authority relating to the incident. It does not relate to all terrorism every place. Several key leaders hope to avoid a repeat of the 1964 Tonkin Gulf Resolution, in which Congress, after North Vietnam allegedly attacked U.S. warships, almost unanimously granted President Johnson the authority, quote, to take all necessary measures to prevent further aggression by North Vietnam. Many in Congress came to regret that as the Vietnam War escalated and grew increasingly unpopular. I would like to know what authority the Federal Reserve... Now, Aaron, this may be the most widespread authorization of use of force since that Tonk Tonkin Gulf Resolution of 1964, but in the Senate it actually took place without any formal debate whatsoever. The Senate simply went into their vote on this after passing that $40 billion emergency aid package. No vote, no dissenting voices whatsoever on this question of the use of force. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives still at work at this late hour. Right now on the floor of the House, what they're debating is, among other things, a possible aid package for the airline industry, which, of course, has been, uh, has been hit by not only these events, but was in financial difficulties uh, before this even happened. Right now you see uh, uh, Democrat uh, Obi, uh, uh, he is, uh, uh, of course, the uh, of uh, top Democrat on the Appropriations Committee talking and about this. This package to aid the airline point. industry would be $2.5 billion dollars uh, in direct uh, uh, aid, direct uh, cash payments to the airlines, as well as $12.5 billion dollars in loan guarantees. The Congress, the House, hoping to get on record on this tonight before they go off uh, for the weekend, and actually they are not coming back until Wednesday of next week, so they hope to get this done before those financial markets reopen, possibly as soon as Monday, to show that the airline industry, despite its, its uh, financial dire straits, will have direct support coming from the U.S. Congress. This, uh, uh, Jonathan, there are a number of things here to talk about. Let me, let me just start at the end with the airline industry. You talk about direct payments, you're talking about somebody's going to write a check to American, United, Delta, and the rest, pretty much, right? That's exactly what they're talking about. The airlines would get $2.5 billion in direct cash, and then in addition, you have those $12.5 billion in loan guarantees. And you've had two of the people that have pushed most vigorously for this have been on the Democratic side, Congressman Gephardt, the minority leader, pushing for this, but also Tom DeLay on the Republican side, broad support for offering direct cash payments for the airline industry because they believe a special industry that has been hit obviously especially hard by this tragedy. And uh, it, it's not a small amount of money. Is it spread out over a period of time or does it all go out the door at once? Well, uh, right now, they are trying to work on some of these details, but this is $2.5 billion in immediate cash payments, and those loan guarantees, I haven't seen the exact uh, language, but my understanding is this is something that would all start happening immediately. And has anyone uh, sat down and started working a calculator to figure out <laughs> what the numbers are at this point? Because uh, I, I, I'll, I'll confess I'm a little lost here. You've got an aid package that's uh, being worked on now, as you just mentioned, and this airline money, there's another couple billion. And you've got the talk of calling up 35,000 reservists. That's a very expensive proposition. They need to be clothed and housed and paid and the rest. Is anybody putting a number on this yet? Well, you really are not happening. I mean, it's really not happening yet. I mean, it was amazing watching this, Aaron. I watched them as they were debating and trying to put together this aid package. And at first, they were talking about numbers of about $11 billion for New York. Then all of a sudden, it went to $20 billion. And then, with almost a snap of your fingers, after the New York delegation met with the president and went to $40 billion in aid package, now they're calling that simply a down payment on what's going to be needed. You've t you, talk, you see this money about the, the bailout of the airline industry. Uh, I've talked to a number of members today as they were milling about bet before the vote, and they say, look, this whole question of the Social Security lockbox, that's over. We don't know how much this is going to talk. One prominent Republican predicted that the entire surplus uh, could be blown uh, trying to deal with this problem. So nobody's really sat down and said, what's this going to mean? What are the costs? They're saying whatever the costs are going to be, if we need to go back into deficit spending, we'll do it. You pretty much have a consensus along party lines on that. Even some of those real budget, you know, deficit hawks on the Republican side that are usually, you know, so adamantly opposed to, uh, uh, to excessive government spending are saying, hey, this is a completely different situation. We have a national emergency here. There are going to be untold defense costs, untold domestic costs in terms of re 
rebuilding the economy in New York and beyond. And uh, they're not really talking about great concern about the deficit anymore. The thing that seemed to be such a paramount concern in Congress uh, just uh, you know four or five days ago is now really not much of a concern at all, at least in this immediate aftermath. Yeah, we remember we were talking about surpluses in the rest four or five days ago. It does seem like a long time ago. Jonathan, thank yeah. you. Jonathan Carl, working late tonight at the Capitol as the House of Representatives continues to work on the aid package and the rest. A um, couple images uh, to show you before we say good night here uh, from us. Back to Seattle first. This prayer vigil that uh, uh, has been going on now for an hour or so. And when we first took a look, uh, it seemed to us it was a, uh, a much smaller number of uh, those votive candles being displayed. As you can see, now there is an enormous number of Seattleites gather out in the Northwest on a Friday in September to pray, to be together, to remember those who have died in this awful week. And we rather suspect to show their support for those men and women who, as we speak, continue to work downtown in New York, down by the World Trade Center or where the Trade Center was, with their heavy machinery and on their hands and knees in some cases, sifting through the debris, looking for signs, listening carefully for any noise, a cell phone ringing, anything that would tell them there is someone there. That is one of the images of a week full of images, and we leave you tonight with a good many other images as well. Most of them, frankly, not very pretty. It has not been that kind of week. But the music underneath them is quite pretty, and that's where we'll say good night. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, <laughs>